new beginning. New beginning. All right, welcome to the Grief Dreams podcast. My name is Sean Ram alongside Dr. Joshua Black. And we're here doing another uh, interview with a special guest. And her name is Tracy McCubbin. She is the author of Making Space Clutter Free, the last book on decluttering you'll ever need, which is uh, actually uh, releasing Tuesday, June 4th, 2019. Uh, While working for a major television director in Los Angeles, Tracy discovered she had the ability to see through any mess and clearly envision a clutter-free space. Coupled with keen time management and organizational skills, Tracy soon found more and more people were asking her for help. Before she knew it, Declutterfy was born. Ten years and thousands of clients later, Declutterfly is Los Angeles' premier organizing and decluttering company. Tracy is regularly featured expert on Hallmark Home and Family, has a column on Mind Body Green, and has regular declutter segments on Fox 5 and ABC Eyewitness News, KTLA Morning Show, KCAL 9, and Good Day Sacramento. She and her company have also been featured in Real Simple, Women's Day, and Shop Smart. When not decluttering, she is the proud co-executive director of One Kid, One World, a nonprofit building strong educational foundations for children in impoverished communities throughout Kenya, and Central America. Tracy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. Yeah, it's really amazing what you do. And I know it's like there's this big trend now to uh, even watch people declutter their stuff (laughs) and also (laughs) declutter their stuff. (laughs) And so I'm really curious, how do you even get into this? Because it doesn't seem like it's a course you take in university. Um, No, it's definitely not that. Um, You know, I started as a personal assistant. I had worked in offices, and then I was a personal assistant to two different people for probably the course of about six years. And one of the people that I worked for was a television director. So when he had time off, I kind of would freelance and work for other people. And I, uh, you know, when you're a personal assistant, you have, you just problem solve. That's all you do. And so I started to get these calls of people who are like, oh, my office is really a mess. And could you maybe help me sort through the paperwork? Or my mom passed away. Could you help me sort through the stuff from her house? And I really, I just, I had a knack for it. I grew up on the child of a hoarder. So I had grown up my whole life watching someone struggle with their relationship to their stuff. So it was just a really interesting segue to be able to go into people's homes and see where they were stuck, to see that, you know, this this collection of old paperwork that they thought they couldn't get rid of was not about decision making in the sense of I need it or not need it, but it was sort of representing, you know, either the failure of their business or the fact that they'd been ignoring doing their taxes. And so it was a representation of something so much more than just oh, I need to throw my junk mail away. Yeah, that's interesting how you said growing up, your your father was a hoarder. And I remember reading a little passage in your book about your your father picking up stuff on the side of the road. I remember my dad used to always do that too, and it drove me nuts. <laughs> and it just like, <laughs> you grab it and you'll put it in the basement and like you never really used it. Uh, and so for you, did you know any different at that time? Or because I know I didn't and I grew up in a way until I met someone that actually had a different upbringing and her her way of living was much more clutter free and it showed me a different way almost is the best way to put it. So when you grew up, did you know any different or was it just something you learned as you grew? That's such an interesting question. And I didn't, you know, I I mean, historically, I come from, you know, my grandmother was all of my grandparents were children of the depression so they saved everything you know my people a lot of my people were farmers and ranchers so it it, it was practical like you know my grandmother saved tinfoil and she saved yogurt cups and we always attributed it to well she lived through the depression and she never knew when she was going to need something or when you're out on the family farm if you run out of something so it was it, it sort of seemed like an extension of that but then as you said you started to go to other people's homes or for me, it was when I started to realize, you know, the, 
the amount of things were taking over my dad's apartment and how many storage units he'd rented, you know, that all of a sudden I was able to see the tipping point and know, oh, this is just beyond being practical and frugal. This is something that's really getting in the way of his life. And that, you know, and it was a long time. I think it was probably not until my 20s that I realized that it was more than just, oh, I'm saving rubber bands because they're handy to have around. And so what was your father's mental blocks? I know you have a couple of different ones listed in your books. What was your father's big, I guess, hang up? You know, for him, I mean, this is the interesting thing. And this is why I'm so excited about this book coming out is, you know, there is hoarding disorder, which is an actual disorder. And they've been doing a ton of research on it. And it's really about people who are managing anxiety and sometimes obsessive compulsive disorder. And then there's just kind of our ordinary everyday cluttering. And so, you know, hoarding disorder is a standalone, and it's really something that people should be working through with a mental health professional. But for us in our everyday clutter, that's what this book addresses. And it addresses the issues of, you know, look, we are in an epidemic of stuff. Stuff's never been easier to buy. You know, you can, I mean, I live in Los Angeles. I can order certain things on Amazon and have them delivered to me in four hours. It's never been easier to buy. And cheap consumer goods are coming at us from all directions. So it's so easy to over, you know, overbuy and, and fill your home up. And so what I'm really looking at is not people who are struggling with hoarding in themselves, but the people who have too much stuff and don't know why, want to live a simpler life, want to, you know, not spend their time managing their stuff, moving it from one place to the next, but don't know why they're so attached to it. So you're saying your dad may have had disorder rather than like an emotional block? 100%. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 100, yes, 100%. Yeah, yes, exactly what I'm saying is that there are people with hoarding disorder that goes much beyond sort of I have an emotional block about this. You know, look, a great example is, and this is one from my own life, you know, I have clothes that I bought a long time ago. I paid a lot of money for them and I can't seem to let them go because I think, oh, one day I'll maybe fit in them again. And, you know, they were really expensive and I shouldn't have bought them in the first place and maybe they didn't fit perfectly. And, you know, I feel bad about myself that I don't fit into them anymore. So for me, it's not an issue of I have a disorder and I can't let go of it. It's that I have in, attached all these bigger feelings onto my stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I found myself uh, when I was I was going through your book and, and uh, reading a different tra- different chapters. And there's bits and pieces of each of your kind of, um, I guess, stages, uh, blocks that, that I found in myself. And that was very interesting. And even like I, I thought about my parents. And, uh, I, and there's this one uh, example you use of um, Asian American family. Um, and um, I think their son had invited you to come help the, the family out. And they had all this kind of uh, wedding presents that they hadn't even opened uh, and, you know, like big China cabinet and all this it reminds me of my parents. Cause you know, we had a big China cabinet and there was tons of stuff. And even as a kid, I'm like, man, why can't we use all this cool stuff? <laughs> right. Right. So to me, when that block is what I call, you know, not feeling worthy that you don't feel good enough to use your nice stuff, you know, you're saving it for some unknown special occasion But when's the special occasion going to come? Like to me, I think you're actually the most worthy to use your nicest stuff all the time. But we have it in our head like that's really fancy and we never use that. And I might not be worth, you know, you know, I might not be worth it. And the, the interesting thing about these blocks is that we all have them at some point and and kind of depending on our lives, they come and they go. Like, you know, for me, I don't have kids, so I'm tend to be less sentimental, but I work with parents all the time who have, you know, a stack of their kids' turkey hands, you know, the little hand, the hands you draw around your hand at Thanksgiving and put the turkey feathers on it. And they're like, but look, they made this. And I'm like, I know, but they're in college. Like, do you need all this? But they're attached to what their kids created because they don't want to forget what it was, the memories of having a kid. So, you know, as people get older and have kids and raise their families, they're going to kind of change the things that they get blocked about. I mean, so many of my 
mom clients say to me, you know, I used to be so organized. I never had all this stuff, but now I have all my kids shoes and baseball bats and toys that they love to play with. And so as life ebbs and flows, what you get blocked about changes. I just wanted to actually touch upon a passage in the book that really uh, I really liked, uh, and I'm just going to read it right now. Uh, you say, although U.S. families have only 3.1% of the world's children, we buy 40% of the world's toys. Uh, the average American home contains over 300,000 objects, and since the beginning of the 2009 recovery, consumer spending on non-essentials has been the fastest growing consumer category. We cram our cars and homes full, and then we run out of room and Three out of four families move the car out of the garage and move more stuff in. Uh, when that fails, personal storage is a twenty-two uh, billion dollar industry. Um, I that really that really resonated with what I was thinking. That's crazy. It's right. It's nuts. I mean, it's just. And you know, I talk about this in the book. I link this clutter crisis that we're living in to the same the same thing as the obesity crisis, right? That now in modern day, you know, people are heavier than they've ever been. And it's been linked to easy access to overprocessed foods. You know, World War II happened. They figured out how to make packaged foods. Everybody, it was cheap. Everybody started buying it and we started overeating. I feel like it's the same thing with cheap consumer goods. It's, you know, in the old days you had... I think I give this example, but you had, you had tea towels, you had your kitchen towels that you use, and you use them and you use them and you use them. They got stained, you kept using them, or you'd bleach them out and hang them and get the stains out. But now you're like, well, I can buy a set of 12 towels for three ninety nine on Amazon. Why am I going to spend any time trying to fix them? And then not thinking that, oh, these towels possibly have been, you know, sewn in Vietnam by child labor workers and then put on a big boat and shipped across the across the ocean creating a huge carbon footprint and then but it's easy for us to go to target and buy them for 4.99 so i think we're not as a society we're not looking at the greater cost of all the stuff that we're buying yeah and that that's a great point and i i think that makes a lot of sense you know with with uh, the advent of kind of globalization businesses are, are now uh producing at an even cheaper level you know, Walmart, all these, all these big box stores, and even Amazon now that's taken over those box stores, things are cheaper and people have easier access to it. And when you think of a growing, when you think about going into a grocery store, it seems like, uh, I, I like that obesity analogy because it's, it's like the, the foods that aren't good for you are cheaper than the foods that are good for you, uh, for the most part. And, uh, that seems to be the case also with, with people just, like you say, use an example of like the tea towels for sure. Or other other things where like you know instead of uh, going ahead and and you reusing or stitching up an old pillow that's kind of lost its fluff or whatever it is, it's cheaper to go out and buy one if the pillow is going to be five bucks at Walmart. Exactly, and also we're not we're losing kind of a consciousness and a an awareness about it, right? That we, I mean this. I, clients say this to me all the time. They're like, I don't know how my house got like this. And I'm like, well, you bought it and you brought it in here. So that's how it got like this. And I think we're not taking accountability for our spending. You know, I was, one of the things I, I love to do kind of the first exercise with clients is instead of telling me I need, well, I need a new this, I need a new that, I need a, a you know, I have a vitamin, but I need a nature blender. It's, it's like, no, no, just change it to want, right? Like, just be honest with yourself and say you want it. And then really examine if it fits into your life. You don't need, I was at clients the other day and they had, there was two people in the house that drank coffee and they had three coffee makers. And I was like, okay, what's going on here? And they're like, well, she likes this one. I like that one. And then when our parents come to visit, I like, you know, they like this one. I was like, Okay, <laughs> like we're, we're going to do a taste test. We're going to find one coffee that everybody likes. We're going to get rid of the rest because you're, you're telling me you want more space on your countertops, but you yet you have three coffee makers. And, you know, when, uh, you know, when in the 40s or the 50s, one person made coffee, everybody drank the coffee that was made. But now we have the option of an espresso, a Keurig, a drip, a Chemex, a, everything. And so it's, it's, I think we're seeing the real downside of availability 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, definitely um, marketing has a big, big, uh, big role in that. I think when we, we were bombarded with ads, bombarded with billboards, Instagram, social media, ads are everywhere, uh, telling us that the, this is the product that's going to make you happy. Or, and <laughs> I hate it when they always tie it. I hate it when they always tie it to an emotional response. Like, you know, if you get this, uh, you know, Starbucks type of, you know, coffee press, that's going to make you look like the people in this commercial or whatever. <laughs> And uh, it seems like that 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 seems to be the main reason why we even get all these extra things that we don't need. Um, I'm going to read one more passage, which I really enjoyed. And happiness is what I'm going to be bringing this conversation back to throughout this book, because that's what I care about for you and everyone I work with. I actually don't care if your towels are put away in rainbow color. I don't need your canned goods to match. I don't need your living room to look like a Japanese temple or your paperwork to be in pretty folders. I don't care about Pinterest. I care about your well-being. I care about you being free from clutter, clutter blocks because once you are, your home will support your living, support you living your fullest, most enjoyable life. And I really enjoyed that. What, uh, what does that mean to you? So that's fantastic. So I've had thousands and thousands of clients and really early on, I realized there's no one prescribed way to do it. There's no one, your home should be organized this way, your home should be organized that way, you have to do it this way. It's different for each person. You know, I'm a single person who lives in a loft versus a family of five people. But what I need and what I want is that when you walk into your home, you feel happy, you don't feel stressed, and it supports you. It gets you out of the door in the morning, you know, without without stressing out about what to wear or, you know, you can make yourself breakfast. It's about having a home that works and is beautiful to you, not this prescribed, you know, perfectly matched pantry. I mean, it, it, in some ways, I think that home organization right now is a little bit like fashion magazines, <laughs> that it's all this sort of aspirational organizing, that it's not practical for how we live. And it's making people feel bad. It's like, look, if you, this is a great example. I have a client who keeps all of her kids, you know, she does her, she has daughters and she does their hair in the morning before they run out to the bus. She keeps it in a drawer in the kitchen. And people will be like, what? That's great. And I'm like, but she has to do their hair at the breakfast table while they're eating so everybody can get out the door in time. So sometimes it's making a decision that helps your life run smoothly as opposed to how it should look. And so that's what I'm really, what I really try and do with my clients. Look, I describe clutter as a constant to-do list, right? You walk in and you see the stacks of mail or you see the clothes piled up on the chair in the bedroom and you just think, oh, I got to deal with that. I got to deal with that. We're already dealing with enough. We're already dealing with enough getting out the door in the morning and traffic and going to a job. And so having less and having things in a way that are organized for you is going to take away a huge chunk of that stress so that when you come home at the end of the day or on the weekend, you know, look, wouldn't you rather spend your weekend riding your bike than cleaning out your garage to find your bike? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It makes total sense. So it's about that. It's about the idea of getting your home, creating a home that works for you and that you feel that it, you know, makes you happy. I mean, I hear people, a lot of people who are collectors, and you know, it makes me nuts. But they love that stuff. And it's there's a tipping point with stuff. And it's it's hard to describe it, but when you're on the other side, you know it. And what I tell my clients is, look, do you feel like you own your stuff or does your stuff own you? Are you spending a lot of money to take care of it, to store it, to, you know, to fix it? Is it is it to a point where you have to move stuff around to find other stuff? That's the tipping point. And I wanna keep everybody on the other side of that. I want to keep everybody where they own their stuff. They're managing their stuff and it's supporting their lifestyle choices as opposed to them spending $400 a month on a storage unit that they haven't looked at in 10 years. But then what would happen to the, the show, Storage Wars? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think we'd have to start watching Top Chef. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so interesting. And when I was reading your book too about the happiness it can bring people, but I'm guessing that's not the case right away. 
do you uh, have a lot of challenges oh. with people letting go? I'm, I'm guessing you must, but and do you, so do you have some stories? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm just working on the job right now, and and it's a lovely woman who's downsizing to a smaller. She's at that point in her life, and she is just giving me what for today. She, I am her least favorite person. <laughs> so you know, because it's confrontive. It's she's looking at a lifetime of memory. She's raised her children in her house, and you know, she's transitioning to her last chapter, the last chapter of her life. And nobody ever wants to talk about that. I think we do. I think our society does us a huge disservice to pretend that that transition is never going to happen, right? We're, we're all going to pass someday. And by ignoring it, when people get to that point, it's so confrontive and it's so painful. Instead of, you know, acknowledging that this is this chapter and this is a time of reflection and um and it's tough it's tough she's having a tough time she uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah I, we had to take we had to take a little break i had to call a little time out we had to go to our own corners but everybody's kissing made up so <laughs> so how does that work how do how do you make up and then how do you move forward because there's a reason why they're stuck and you only have a certain amount of time with them so like what's that process like it's process a, like you know, it's really about it's really about focusing on um, it's really about focusing on the goal. She really wants to move to this new place. It's a smaller apartment. She has friends that live in the building. You know, there's a lot of positive on it. So what I do for her is let's concentrate on moving forward. When she gets in there, we can look backwards. We're not sorting through photos now. We're not looking at that. We're just reminding of the upside, the benefits that she's going to have when she gets into the new place. So by keeping people focused forward and the vision that they have for themselves, you know, sometimes it's simple as, you know, I want to clean out the house, cause this extra bedroom, because I want my grandparents to, I'm sorry, I want to clean out my guest bedroom because I want my grandkids to come visit. It's about setting a goal. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Like, look, a beautiful picture on Instagram, in the end of the day, it's not that motivating. But the idea of I want to have my grandkids come visit me for a week, that's motivating. There has to be a personal, you know, a personal gain out of it. So what I really try and do is keep people focused on that. I think that's good to have set these overall arching goals. So to remind yourself on why you're doing what you're doing and why you're facing the pain and letting go of, you know, so all this different stuff through your past. I think it was interesting too, what you said about helping prepare almost those people when she does die. So it's not overwhelming for them. I think that's another great reason if people are acknowledging the death of a loved one or you're acknowledging your own death that's something to, to keep in mind to realize this stuff when i die it's going to belong to someone else and they might just throw everything away and so there's almost a, like <laughs> well, there's a very, my favorite new yorker cartoon there's a new yorker cartoon where there's an a clearly old man and a younger man standing in front of a garage and the garage door is open and it's packed to the gills. Like you couldn't fit a credit card in it. And the old man and the captain says, someday son, this will all be yours. <laughs> Just, <laughs> it cracks me up. So here's a great story. I have a lovely couple a uh, woman I've worked with for a long time and worked with her with the passing of her husband and she's at an age now she's almost 90 and she has all this beautiful jewelry that her husband bought her she's never going to wear it again it's a very specific style it's quite flashy it's it's just not what she's wearing these days and she's starting to give it away to her granddaughters and to her nieces and some people are like no no you can't give it away like that's so morbid because she's like i want you know i'm not going to be wearing this much longer i'm not going to be here no don't talk about that don't talk about that but what they're cheating her out of is this amazing opportunity for her to go to lunch with her granddaughter and see her granddaughter wearing that ring, you know, that she'll know that something she loved got passed on. And so to me, it's a really, I just think it's a missed opportunity to let someone process their eventual past, to tell you the memories and the stories about that ring and see you wear it and know that someone's happy. It makes it makes letting go of the stuff for sure easier. And I think that not letting people talk about it and process it ahead of time 
is kind of cheating everybody out of a really profound experience. On that note, I really enjoyed when you talk about letting go after death or divorce. We'll get into death maybe in, in a bit, but let's talk about something like, you know, uh, breaking up with a couple or divorce and people have a hard time. And I like the tip that you give in that, you know, if, if someone that like, you know, has a partner that, you know, left or is not, they're not living with them and they have a lot of, of their stuff. You know, you allow them to keep like three items. So you just narrow it down to, hey, okay, then keep three items and then see how that works for you after a few months. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's about, you know, I think it's about putting caps on yourself. Uh, I always say the amount of stuff you keep from someone who passed away or, you know, you broke up with in no way reflects how much you love them, right? Like I have a handful of things for my grandmother it doesn't take away the fact that I loved her dearly and sometimes when people split up I mean look there's the practicality of it right there's the practicality of um you know couches and beds and like no one you know not everyone can go out and afford to buy a whole new household of furniture but the sentimental things like is it helping you move forward in your life to hang on to all that stuff uh, I helped a guy who had a whole storage unit full of, you know, a lot of stuff. And we went through it and he got rid of everything. And it was a terrible, ugly, painful divorce. And we got down to like the last boxes of all the photos and her wedding dress was in there and like a lot of stuff. And we had the big shredder come and he just had a moment. He was like, you know what? He kept one photo. He like just was like, I want to get get rid of it and he threw it on the giant shredder and it was like a modern day viking burial you know there was something symbolic of like shredding it all up so i think it's again looking forward you know the amount of stuff that you're keeping is that going to is that going to help you get to the next stage in your life do you want to meet someone new do you want to let go of you know the resentment like if you are resenting the person you broke up with and you've got a house full of their things you're not going to move through that fast or at the rate you need to so for me it's about like let that stuff go and give yourself the literal space process through yeah i like that and i like two of some of your points when it comes to helping people let go of stuff after a death i think this is a great transition point for that and you really talk about there's there's difference in the clutter if it's a sudden death versus if it's a prolonged death. Could you go into that and maybe the differences you've seen in people? Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Look, a sudden death is, it's just, it's the toughest one. And, and what kind of happens is that life, you know, life stops on a day and it turns on a dime. And so you really, it's kind of harder to let, it's kind of harder to do a clean sleep because you're living life and then all of a sudden life changed. And when, when someone's dealing with a longer illness, it is nice. I mean, nice is such a strange word, but there is, there is something in being able to kind of go through that stuff with them or, you know, let them, let them be involved in the process of letting go. And so that oftentimes I find that when it's been a prolonged illness, it's often easier for the people to sort of let that stuff go in a shorter period, right? Because they've really been grieving and mourning for for a lot longer. That makes sense, right? You're, you're sort of with someone six months or a year. So by the time that they finally transition, you're kind of ready to move that stuff out, especially if it's sort of the trappings of an illness, which are always really hard to have around. And uh, that would be um, an ideal time for that person, you know, if it's a prolonged illness or, or um, you know, sickness and what have you to kind of uh, start giving away their stuff. Um, I think, cause you mentioned in your book that things, obviously things can get messy after the person dies and, you know, the family and siblings or everybody's kind of, you know, taking their turns, kind of figuring out what they want, what's theirs and whatnot, and it can cause problems. But one way to avoid that is if the person who is sick or about to die does it on their own terms. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And it can be a beautiful thing at that moment. Like, cause you know, if you're giving something to your nieces, your grandparent, grandkids or whatever. So there's a note to all you older people out there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Start giving it away. Well, the 
Jake, Jake and my family, my grandmother did that, and so she would, she had post-its that she put on, she would ask you, do you want this, do you want that, and she put post-its on it, and then if she got mad at you, she'd take the post-it off, and you'd have to earn your way back onto it. <laughs> but I think it's, I absolutely, I think, I know it's a difficult conversation for people, but I think it's a really missed opportunity. I think it's a missed opportunity, like I said, for stories to be shared, and this is where this came from, and someone to see the joy of getting passed along. And I think to wait, you know, to wait until afterwards, that's where the confusion comes in. And that's where people think, think things are more valuable than they are, or someone's, you know, I should have gotten that and you shouldn't have. And I think the pe the clearer that people can be with their wishes, it just makes the transition so much smoother. Yeah. It's like, well, there's certain stuff for certain people, but there's so much clutter <laughs> or so much stuff that they own. It's not all labeled in, in the actual will. And so I really like your approach to maybe how to like really settle that within families. Is this something you learned along the way or is this something someone else told you? You know, I've been, uh, I, I, I've just seen it with so many clients. I've helped so many clients after you know, after parents or grandparents have passed away. So I've just seen people deal with it and all. I've seen siblings steal from each other, you know, tucking silver in a suitcase when nobody's looking. And then I've seen other families who have done versions of a family auction and it's gone beautifully. So it's really experience on the job. And, you know, and it's such a tough time anyways. And so much of the time, you know, one of the things people don't realize is that it's really not about the stuff. Right, but you really don't want that silver turkey carver. You know, it's that you're grieving the loss of someone you loved. And so, if, I, I think if we can kind of, it's it's weird. It's almost like we have to take the emotion out of it and acknowledge what it represents. And then, when the thing comes back into our life, know that really what it's serving is a reminder of great memories. That you look at it and you remember the good times, as opposed to. I should have this, or I earned this, or this is worth a lot of money, but that, you know, it's a, it's a talisman of sorts. Yeah. And, and hopefully it is about the grief. Sometimes it is about the money. <laughs> I've seen enough <laughs> to know that too. Yes, oftentimes <laughs> it is. <laughs> and so oftentimes I really, it is. I do like the auction about having basically a auctioneer come in and basically evaluating the stuff and then having sort of this mock auction when you have basically monopoly yeah, money yeah yeah it's great i've seen it i've seen it done a lot of times and it works fantastic it just works it feels very equitable to people and it's also you know it's a it's a process so kind of people get to go through it and people laugh and people tell their own stories and that it can be really really cathartic and a way to talk talk about things and process i think that the you know the Less things are sort of swept under the carpet and not dealt with. I mean, look, nobody, you know, nobody likes to talk about passing away. Nobody likes to deal with it. But I think sometimes these almost ritualistic experiences help families pass through it and and create a new a new way of being without with honoring what came before. And so that, yeah, I, I, it's great. I've seen it happen. I've seen it. I've seen it like with the little grandkids and they all get to pick their special thing. It's, it's really neat. Yeah, it, it's pretty, it's a really cool concept and you're right. It can be a really fun experience also. And it's a fair way of doing things than someone else just divvying it up with what they think it should go. But the other thing I thought was really interesting is finding stuff that opens your eyes on who the person was. And I think that can happen a lot especially if our parents die and you start looking through the stuff they own. I know some of the stuff can be humorous, as you say, but stuff can be uh, horror. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do like to tell people. My mom was like, so everyone should have what I like to call the cleaner, that the person that if you die suddenly comes through your house and removes the stuff you don't want anybody else to find because we've all got it. So, you know, just make sure that you... But, you know, people, I mean, it's interesting. I, I was reading an article about these, about everyone taking those DNA tests, you know, 23 and Me, and how people are, all, you know, finding out that their fathers aren't their fathers and that, you know, their family, what they thought it was, wasn't. And, you know, there's that, uh, a lot of, through the stuff, a lot of secrets get revealed. And sometimes it can, like you said, can be really humorous. And sometimes it's like, 
oh, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> so I think it's, it's an interesting, it's just really interesting to watch people navigate it. Yeah, and I think there's some people out there, not myself, that uh, probably want <laughs> probably want someone to like delete their web history or stuff like that. You know? <laughs> yeah, oh, trust me, I have a friend who I'm like, if something happens to me, get my phone and my computer. <laughs> Whatever you gotta do. <laughs> that's fine. I think that's like another thing is just cleaning up a computer or like an electronic device because it doesn't, you can't see it like you can see stuff and like material stuff because i remember i was changing yeah. over my computer i'm like where are all these is, files are insane and i'm like i almost didn't want to go through it all but that's just its own little task to do but it's so deceiving because it's all on like a small device i know i know and i think i have been reading i know there are a couple of companies that are doing kind of what they call i think they're sort of calling them digital bibles where they have all the passwords and kind of you know how to navigate through that but that's i mean look you know, we we haven't even started to talk about the amount of digital photos that people have. Like, you think you think hard printed photos are tough to deal with? People have tens and thousands of photographs on their hard drives, like in a big giant jumbled mess. I mean, I think in the next ten years, that's going to be the next kind of cr clutter crisis. Like, how do you deal with all the digital photos? That's got to be your next book, then. <laughs> <laughs> get ahead get ahead of the curve <laughs> like exactly. that big bonfire That's... like that bonfire throw that hard drive right in there <laughs> i know exactly that's so funny i mean i looked at my phone the other day and i was like how do i have seven thousand photos what you know <laughs> That's wild. I think this is a good moment too to, I think, touch on uh, your own loss and what that was like for you. And then maybe things that you saw through that process that kind of opened your eyes a little bit about decluttering. And so have you suffered a loss in your life? I have. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking, I knew we were going to be talking about this and I was thinking about the late 80s and early 90s um, and living through the AIDS crisis and how many people I lost during that time, you know, and just in such a quick period. And they were all these, you know, these men with these amazing personalities and artistic. And, and it's funny, I have, um, I have a couple of things that pop up. I have a, like a little vintage Bakelite purse that I remember my friend Avery, we went to the thrift stores in Santa Barbara and it was, I think it was like a dollar 25. And I was like, oh, that seems like so much money. And he, you know, he said, just buy it, just buy it. And it's, I think from the 40s and it's just fantastic and it broke and I fixed it with a paper clip and and every time I see it it's way in the back and I don't I don't take it out as much as I used to um, I'm just reminded of that time and those people and those people that I lost and it's it may it it makes me alternately very sad, but also very happy. And to think about going to the clubs, dancing and wearing vintage clothes and carrying this purse. And so it's amazing that this one really beautiful little item can remind me of, you know, a dozen people that, that we all lost too soon. Wow. That is interesting in the sense of having that, that one item. And you're right. Like it helps with the memories and bringing it back and reminding yourself and, you do mention that it's it's okay to go slow and to keep some stuff. You're not saying to throw everything out. <laughs> You're saying that. No, you know, of course yeah. not. And look, sometimes you have to understand sometimes too, it'll come in waves, right? That it'll be, you know, that it'll be uh, the first round, that it'll be the easy stuff. And then, you know, as the move happens or as things, as you, your life changes, you move into a new home, that there will be another round and you'll kind of, whittle it down to fewer and fewer and i always tell people when you're dealing with a loss like go easy on yourself and everybody's going to tell you a way to do it and it's just you figure out what works for you you know you really really listen to yourself and just in the moment and in the really intense early days of the grieving process it may not be you may not be in a place to make those decisions so just just go easy on yourself and just don't listen to everybody because everybody's going to say, you need to do it in three months. You need to do it in a year. You need to, you, you know, you need to do what you need to do. But I would say, I guess if I could say anything to anybody, it's err on the side of keeping the things that bring you the happiest memories and not the very sad ones. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I like that. And when it comes to your own it's loss, a pretty good yeah, test. it is. <laughs> it definitely is. Um, and when it comes to your own losses, so you had the the many friends um, and colleagues that sort of died to the AIDS crisis. Was that difficult for you going through that because of the wave of deaths that were occurring at that time? Yeah, it was tough. It was weirdly. Um, it was weirdly. It just kind of happened so fast that you got a little bit. I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine, and this was the old days when we had address books, like everybody's numbers wasn't on our phone. And he was like, oh, he said, it's, you know, it's time to change my, time to get a new address book. And he goes, and I went through, I was going through my old one, and I realized so many people had passed that it was just easier to throw it away, that the people, the people I still had in my lives, I knew their numbers. So it was, you know, it was a really intense, you know, wave after wave after wave that I think sometimes we just put our heads down and got through it. Um, and, you know, we, I, it's, I said to somebody the other day, and I can't, I can't remember what it, I can't remember what led to it, but I was just thinking like how different, you know, how different the world would have been or art would have been or fashion would have been if we hadn't lost all those people. You know, what what would have shifted? What would we have been seeing? Where would we be in the, LGBTQ movement now if that if we hadn't lost so many of those people. Yeah, those are good questions to reflect on. And how was it how was that different? Because I can only imagine you're right, like you put your head down because there's so much loss going on and it's almost too much to really handle. You just like loss after loss after loss, compared to when your grandmother passed away. And you know, what did you see differently in yourself and how you grieved that? You know, my grandma was, I was very lucky she lived to be 101, and um, and she was very, it, you know, she was Scottish and very practical, so she had been, you know, her joke was that she wanted to leave her house feet first, like she wanted to die in her own house, and I saw, you know, probably the last year of her life, I saw, she just said some things that I was very attuned to, She, you know, she said, she said, you know, she said, not only are all my friends gone, but my friends' kids are gone. And and she said, I'm just a little bored. And it wasn't that, you know, she volunteered at the church and she did lots of stuff, but I, I saw her sort of not read the paper as much as she used to and maybe her, her sense of learning. So I feel very lucky that I got to witness her making a really kind of a, a, a choice, a conscious choice that she was getting ready to pass. And um, so that when she went as awful and heartbreaking, it was also really, I just felt really honored that I got to go through that process with her. And, you know, she lived her life and passed in her home and the way she laid down to take a nap and never woke up. And, you know, there was a real, um, there was a real beauty to it. And it, it made it a little easier because I was like, she was 101. It wasn't, you know, I had taken her to the doctor probably about six weeks or a month before she passed. And the doctor said, you know, I really think you should cut out butter and your glass of scotch every day. And she was like, because you're going to buy me three more weeks? Like, no. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm sure. So it was those moments of being able to talk about it and her sense of humor about it that made, um, you know, kind of as opposed to seeing it as a loss necessarily, but seeing it as, I was so lucky to have her in my life for that long and to be able to sit across a table from a woman who had seen Haley's Comet twice and whose first car had been a Model T and that, um, you know, that so many of those experiences she shared me. So the the grieving was just more of an honoring of how much I got from her. And I think that, and that's a thing that, you know, it's funny, the few things, the things that I have about her are great, but what really reminds me when I make myself a cup of tea, because the ritual that she and I shared and she did every day of her life. So that's when I always think of her. And it's so nice that it doesn't have to be a perfect tea set or a teacup she gave me, but that anywhere I am in the world, when I make a cup of tea with a little bit of sugar and cream, I'm reminded of her. So for me, it's really, it's great to be able to have that memory and have those feelings kind of represented in a little ritual. 
That's nice. And what did you take from her after she died? Like what belongings? Uh, I, I have so little, I have a leather satchel, like a leather bag that she carried every day. Um, it's so impractical. I'll never carry it. Um, I have a few, a ring and a necklace and maybe some scarves. I have so little, I have so little, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't in any way diminish my great love for her. Like, I do wish though there was a BMW 1600 that unfortunately got in a car accident. My brother and I are both like, man, we wanted that car. <laughs> but, oh yeah. It was a collector. I know, so she, she drove it brand new off the showroom floor. We're both like, oh, that car. <laughs> That's one of the only things that I'm like, if I, anything I could have had, but <laughs> I've had plenty of cars. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you got to experience that. Um, you know, sitting with a grandparent and uh, going through that like uh, special moment, and it it's so true. It's it's sometimes it's not the expensive things; it's the simple things that just remind you. And our minds are so strong. And if you have happy memories and you you lived with a person and, and can really remember those memories, that's what it's all about. You know, if you had tea with her, I mean, that's a simple thing, but it's a, it's a strong uh image and that that goes for like a lot of other things uh you know i can just think i can just for my own grandmother uh i could think of like maybe you know how she made um you know she had made she made like a, a type of indian pasta one time um i don't have anything from her but like it's just memories of those moments uh or just you know going for walks with them um i think those are the strongest things in in my mind well, and I think that's what I, that's what I, you know, if I could convey anything to the people listening and, you know, hearing this conversation is that, that to remember, to know that the reason you're keeping this stuff is not that, you know, people have passed. It's not that you really want the stuff, you know, maybe some of it, you know, that BMW, but you know, that you don't, that you want the memory. That's what you really want. And if you're clear about that, then the stuff's going to lose the importance and you're going to know that you're not going to lose the memories and that you want to be, you know, you want to just have enough things to remind you that that person had an impact on your life and that you love them and you still love them. And so that's, that's what I'm hoping for people that they'll acknowledge the sort of process, you know, where in the process the stuff is that the stuff isn't the end game. It's the getting you to the next place. And I think if people start to really see that the stuff is going to lose its importance it's not going to matter so much i just thought of something and you might be able to use this as your in your next book for a tip but what if you just take pictures of all the things you can't really keep and then just put that in we do it i know you already do do it it all the time yeah i do it all the time i mean generationally you know my sort of client thing 75 or 80 it's hard for them to wrap their brain around it but my clients in their 50s and 60s yeah all the time just take pictures just take pictures um and sometimes when we're moving somebody out of a like a lifetime home we'll take pictures of the home as it was and then make you know make one of those photo books like you know the apple books and so that they can have a book of what it looked like and when they want to remember it they can flip through it that's a great idea, Sean. Thank uh, you. That's a, that's, <laughs> I'm glad you already went up ahead too, Tracy. Uh, so at the end of the day, I think that's great. And it's just another way of simplifying your life and but keeping the memory. And you're right, it is that memory. I'm curious mm-hmm. on one question that we, we like to, uh, to ask about on the podcast is, have you ever had a dream of anyone who's died, either any of the, your friends that died in the AIDS epidemic or your grandmother? You know, it's funny. My grandmother shows up a fair amount. She um, uh, she tends to show up in my dreams when I'm in a lot of anxiety, uh, and I think um, and I think because she was so practical and rational, that um, she was not. Uh, you know, worrying wasn't. She didn't put a lot of stock in worrying. It was sort of solving the problem. And so I have. I, I was also thinking about this. I have when I'm in a bunch of anxiety and she'll sort of pop up in funny places and, and I tend to wake up the next morning and go like, all right, let's make a list, let's pros and cons, let's, you know, delegate what we can. And, you know, instead of spinning my wheels and try and worrying about getting it done, like coming up with an action plan. So I always think that when she shows up in my dreams, that she's sort of a reminder 
that a plan of action will always get you out of a situation instead of running around like a worried chicken with your head cut off. So I'm always, I'm always happy when she shows up. Oh, that's so cool. And does she talk or is she just like in the background and it's just that reminder? No, it's funny. She, he, she doesn't. And now that I'm thinking about it, it's funny. She sort of just she pops up sort of places. She was this little teeny Scottish lady. And so she would sort of, she would sort of show the room in the background. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting. I, I, you know, it's funny. She actually doesn't really talk, but it's, huh. it's a kind of very calming vision for me in a dream. That's so interesting. It's just, it's just like we're, <laughs> you open a door, there she is. And you're just like, whoa. Yeah, kind of. Or sometimes it's like a big dinner table and she'll be sitting at the head of the table. Or, you know, I'll walk into a room and she'll be in the room. <laughs> That's really interesting. And I'm really curious, too, is since you've had so many dreams, is she like 101 years old or is she a little younger? You know, it's funny. She, it's so interesting. That's just an interesting question. She shows up. She had my dad later in life. So she sort of shows up in my dreams in about her 60s, 60s or so, you know, when I was, when I was spending a lot of time with her, like still grandma-ish for sure, but not, uh, not at the end. Like in, when I remember, you know, she and I would travel together and kind of when our lives were very active together, but definitely like gray hair and like a little grandma shoes and, you know, she shows up in a practical pantsuit and, <laughs> wow. and yeah, but very much as I remember her. Her hair always done in my dreams. Her hair is always done because we would go to the beauty parlor and she would get her hair done. Oh, that's that's so nice and so interesting. <laughs> also, with the so the hair being done and also forty years younger, and like that's something. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting kind of image that is occurring, and I love it. I, I love know. that I you know. have that. I know. I wonder if it's something about that. With, you know, my teen years and my twenties when things were you know chaos and hormones and and that she was really a, a constant solid presence that maybe, you know, in these anxiety dreams, I sort of, my, my, you know, whatever gets us there goes to this very calming, solid presence. So she's like put together and, you know, her plaid pants on, her hair done, and just really a, a calming, um, just a calming vision in all of it. That's beautiful. I'm glad it's making you feel comforted and also reminding reminding you of her and her wisdom and then for allowing you to take some initiative in your own life to now like stop worrying and actually getting to the, the issue of the problems. <laughs> yes, worrying is a <laughs> wasted. <laughs> I do it all the time. I perfected it, but <laughs> I'm feeling like this stuff is getting me nowhere. What am I doing? All right, let's make a list. Yeah, worrying is like clutter for the mind. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I totally agree. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. So our uh, our last question we always like to ask our guests is, if you could have a dream tonight, what dream would you want to have of someone who's died? Wow. Uh, this is, okay, Not I'm not a huge Beatles fan, but I'm staying in New York right now, and we're staying like a block away from the Dakota and we walked through Strawberry Fields, the park that Yoko Ono had built for John Lennon after he was killed. And I was like, there was just, there's something about that space and him and who he was to the world. And I was like, wow, I wish I'd seen him. Like I just thought that last night. And so I think if I was like, you know, if I was asleep tonight and he could kind of come in that, in that space and in this place and seeing his memorial garden that would be really cool that is interesting and would you want him to be maybe alone and maybe singing or would you just want him to pop up maybe with your grandma in the background of some <laughs> dinner table my grandma, my, my grandma on tambourine <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, I, I think I would just, uh, I think I would want him to tell me that peace is possible, that peace around the world is possible. That's what I'd like to hear. I like that. So that one-on-one -on -one kind of connection. Yeah, that'd be cool and funny. Not, yeah, yeah, funny. Well, I'll have to let you guys know if it if it happens tonight. I'll have to let you know. <laughs> Please do. And I don't know if you know. Do you know the? You must know the Beatles song "Let It Be." Yes, very well. So, so that actually was written because of a grief dream. Oh, really? 
Oh, that's so interesting. I'll have to listen to it again. I'll have to listen to it again. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm going to listen it through, through that lens. Yeah, it was Paul. Um, he basically was talking about it, and he was saying how basically his mother died. And he had this dream where the mother, his mother came to him and he was really stressed out. And she said, let it be, just let it be. It's all going to work out. And so he's like, then he woke up, he felt comforted. And they said, I've never heard that before. Let it be. And then that's when he wrote the song. So yeah, when you, when you look at the song as it's actually his mother being the one saying that stuff, it has a different meaning altogether. Than, rather I'm, than Mother I'm Mary. I'm literally yeah. listening to it when we hang out, like when we get off this interview, because that's fascinating to me. And before we wrap things up, I actually have one one question about your grandmother. What was the secret to her longevity other than butter and whiskey? <laughs> you know, she, I think it was, she, um, she worked. She worked every day, you know, she went and uh, when she stopped, you know, working as a secretary in her church, she volunteered at the nursery school in her church. And I think it was staying engaged. It's a crossword puzzle every day. You know, she was forever sort of taking a class on computers or reading a new book. She was sent to talk radio. I think it was keeping her brain and her soul engaged in learning which um, was fascinating. She would travel. She just was always, she lived sort of a, a simpler life, but she was always reading about something new or the changes in the world, exposing herself to different cultures. You know, she uh, she had become friends with a family that had immigrated from Vietnam, so she wanted to learn all about Vietnamese food. And I think it was the learning that kept her alive for so long. Wow, that's incredible, and I, I, I believe that as well. I think that uh, you know, expanding your your mind and your your learning new things, you know, past, you know, again into your seventies, eighties, you know, hundred. Why not? You know, and, and that just keeps you fresh and sharp. And um, you know, again, on the subject of learning, uh, I really enjoyed your book. I, I didn't get through all of it, but I, I will finish it up later. But there's there's <laughs> definitely a lot of chapters and a lot a lot of um, a lot of uh, great tips, but also I love that you're focused on overall happiness for an individual. And I think that uh, it really comes off as uh, authentic and genuine. Oh, I'm so glad you guys enjoyed it. This was a fascinating conversation. This is, this is great. This is fantastic. I can't, I, I'm so excited for people to listen to this, you know, this talk and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go listen to Let It Be. You gotta close out this episode with Let It Be now. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could pay those guys. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's expensive. <laughs> so, Tracy, can you uh, be, uh, shout out your handles and uh, maybe where people can reach your book when it comes out? So you can get yep, your book. It's gonna, it's, yep, it's gonna. Yep, it's uh, called Making Space Clutter Free: The Last Book on Decluttering You'll Ever Need. It's actually available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Target.com. And they can find me. Facebook's a great community. I'm just Tracy McCubbin, M C C U B B I N, and then also on Instagram at, at Tracy underscore McCubbin. Excellent, uh, excellent. Thank you again. And uh, so for our platform, uh, you can reach us at griefdreams.ca for more information on the topic. Uh, we did add a donation button, and there are perks to those who donate. If you have Facebook, you can join the Grief Dreams group. You can share your dreams or hear more uh, dreams of others. Uh, we are on Twitter and Instagram at Grief Dreams. And uh, as always, we love to end our podcast with love and gratitude from us to you. Introduce myself. You have introduced yourself. This is a very good conversation.